Hi there, my name is Lee Taylor and I am a composer from Bristol. Um, today I'm going to be talking about tracking um, and layering live musicians recordings with virtual instruments, which is something that um, many uh, composers do these days for reasons of budget primarily, uh, I would say. But also, you know, there are some artistic reasons towards it too. Um, you know, for example, if you did if you wanted to have some um, virtual sounds that to your ears were better manipulated, you know, if you wanted to pitch them down or something like that, then you can have some, a sort of a hybrid score there in that sense. Um, I personally would prefer the, you know, if the budget allowed for it, like an entire uh, live session with, you know, all the music being live except electronic stuff. Um, but you know this particular score that I'm going to show you today didn't allow for that budget wise but we did get a quite uh, a few nice really nice recordings I should say of um, some string instruments which I was able to layer on top of the string orchestra uh, and a whole orchestra as well so I'm going to be walking you through that today I might have put this into two parts so I guess we'll see um, but for now let's just jump straight over to logic um, Actually, before we do, I just wanted to say, um, as a little bit of a channel update, sorry that I haven't been uploading very much recently, um, I've been super, super busy, but hopefully I will be able to upload more regularly now, and also I've bought a brand new um, camera for myself, a nice uh, Sony Alpha uh, 6400. Um, and I'm getting really into that whole side of things now. So I want to sort of ramp up the production load, um, give you guys some more content. Um, let me know in the comments if there's anything you'd want content-wise. Um, I'm thinking of maybe doing a little bit of vlogging as a composer, life as a composer. Um, and just some more tutorials and stuff like that. I've got a video essay in the works which has been a long time in the running um, in the background. It's, uh, it's going to be about... Rachmaninoff. It's How to Write for Orchestra Part 3 um, and so hopefully that will be coming out within the next 30 days let's say but you know we'll see how we go with that but yeah um, anyway please do leave a like and subscribe if you if you enjoy this video but let's just jump straight into logic so this is a score session for my um, work on a film I've done recently called Circling the Drain uh, the full album of this can be found on my YouTube channel and soon it will be released on Spotify as well. Um, but basically this is my session, so my Logic session. Um, so as you can see here I've got a whole bunch of tracks. Um, this is actually part of my template. If I press this button it reveals the instruments that I'm not using, like saxophone or something. Um, which I'm pretty sure I don't use. <laughs> uh, there's a whole, there's a very large amount of instruments on here, uh, a couple of hundred tracks. But you know, as you can see, like half of these I haven't used at all. Um, so to save space on my template, I just press that button. It hides the tracks I'm not using. Um, you can do that, by the way, if you're interested. You can set that up in the um, Logic Pro key commands, um, and you can just go in here, I think what it's called is hide uh, empty tracks, I think that's the one uh, so I've just selected this, that button but yeah, so that's how you do that but I recommend going through the key commands and having a look at what you can change yourself in any case, let's jump straight into this so, to start with I wanted to show you one of the scenes in the film um, which I've been working on and how I went about it. So I started off actually, which I don't have anymore, I deleted, but I started off with a little piano sketch of essentially um, this, which is just some chords, some melody, and you know, just went along like this basically. And then I, add, I add, added the strings um, and basically spread out the um, arrangement throughout the string orchestra. So once I'd done that, I then sampled it um, and made it all smooth and changed the modulation so that it could be nicely uh, played as if it was as real as possible. And um, it ended up sounding a little bit, well, like how I'm about to show you in a minute. But first of all, I better actually explain something else. The 
theme of this um, film is is this. Um, excuse that violin in the background. I think I've got Dorico open because I need to show you that in, in a minute as well. But yeah, basically that's that. So the that's the main theme. Um, I can show you the main theme tune in a bit, but I recommend checking out the the full album whilst we're doing this so you can have some reference. Basically that th that whole thing sounded a little bit like this without any live recordings at all. Um, let's just add that and there's a gong somewhere. Oh yeah, a tam tam I should say. And it sounded like this. much longer but essentially um, I must admit this has been mixed uh, after putting the live musicians in so it doesn't sound as good as on it own on its own as it used to because I've mixed it to make the live recordings really you know brighten up the score so I had to remix it basically but the the premise is there basically you get the idea so, for, so the first thing I wanted wanted to do was hire a cellist to play the cello line there as a soloist. First of all my intention was to layer that on top of the uh, cello section which I did do but I ended up actually boosting it so that it sounded more like a solo cello on its own um, with some cello in the background as opposed to blending it with the section. Um, and then I thought actually I can hire some violinists and um, some viola players to do the other bits but I just basically did a soloist for each line uh, with, they're all in divisi and I'll show you the score in a minute um, and and then we we recorded them in and basically layered them with some mixing techniques so what I'm going to show you now is once I'd figured out that I essentially transcribed my logic session into this um, which is the actual score side of things from uh, the logic side which I then used to distribute out into parts and then I sent those off to the relevant musicians um, who I hired on Fiverr and if you're interested in using them I will link them in the description because they are phenomenal musicians they've done some really amazing work um, so maybe you should hear how this sounds as well just so you can get an idea of how much better it sounds with the live orchestra Uh, you'll also note that I've added a few performance directions here which will come appear in the part so that they can really get a feel for what's going on in the music. Anyway, that's that basically. So the next thing we did is we sent those off to the, um, the performers and we got them to record it. And I got some amazing results, which I'm I couldn't be more happy with, honestly. Um, and what we got was this, and I'll show you this. The first thing that arrived actually was the cello, the three celli, I should say. And then I got the, uh, the, these were all actually performed by one person uh, playing different instruments. The, the same for the cello, a different person, but all the same parts were by her. Um, and so this is what the violins and the viola sound like. They're playing soltasto. If you didn't know, soltasto is when you play, when you bow uh, on the actual, um, What's it called now? The bridge? No, that's not the right bit. The neck. 
the neck of the violin, sorry, you play on the neck of the violin uh, and it makes a nice glassy sort of um, thinner sound, um, almost ethereal I would say is a good word to, de to use to describe that. So that's basically that. And then I layered it all on. And originally, you know, when you, if you look at some of these uh, other layers, you know, they're all different volumes here. That's because when I just loaded them straight in, and yes, they, you know, they were playing the correct dynamics and stuff, because they're not playing in the hall together, they're separate lines of solo musicians. You really have to be quite careful with mixing. Uh, that's the, that's part of, that's the main reason I'm making this video is basically how to mix them together because when you uh, are asking a bunch of players to record together it is vastly different sound to how they would sound in a hall when they're all playing together um, because first of all they can balance themselves off of each other get the dynamics perfect if they've got a conductor then that helps even more because they'll he'll just tell them exactly how to how loud to play like oh you need to quiet down you need to play a bit louder blah 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 um, but, you know, I, th I think, you know, you're kind of expecting this, oh yeah, I've got loads of uh, violins coming in, I'm going to plonk them in there and it's going to sound great. And when you plonk them in there, they're just all over the place, really loud at one point, the whole thing's a lot louder than the sample libraries, you know, you really need to start playing with it uh, to, to layer it in properly. Not least because the sample libraries are recorded as a unit you know, the, the whole section in one hall, it's very different. So the first thing I did was that I applied a reverb, um, well, three reverbs actually, um, to this stack, this stem summing stack of all the, it's basically a bus for all of these uh, violins, uh, all these strings. So um, what I've got here is I've got some chroma verb going on here, um, quite wet as you can see, um, and Basically, that is just helping give it some um, room-like echo on the end of things. Um, this makes it sort of, it, it makes that tail a bit sort of nicer, I would say. It kind of, I haven't got this mixed in too loudly, um, but basically what it does for me, for, to my ears, um, is it... I don't really like the tail of this chroma verb, to be honest. I find that it's a bit modulation -y, you know, uh, modulative, I think is a better word. It kind of wobbles a bit at the end of the tail uh, in an electronic sort of artificial way. And so I find that the ecosphere helps with that a little bit, smoothens it out, blends it together. And then what I did is also I added this great plugin called Panagement 2, which is the free p version. I haven't bought the upgrade. Uh, it's a great plugin especially because it's free and essentially it's a um, I don't know how you, a convolution type reverb I think and basically what you would do is you can set all these presets and I basically change it so it's um, much more realistic because the, the it's kind of the the free versions presets are a lot more meant for really big huge reverbs that are just you know unbelievably wet basically um, so you, I change it to the concert hall instead of a cave. Um, you can change the size of the room. You can change the tail length. You can change the bass amount. You can change how wide it sounds, um, whether it's tilting to the left or right. Um, the, the decay of the sound, how wet it is, um, the amount of it, it's great. Um, you can even check it in mono for the mix, which is nice. Um, and this is probably my favorite part of it and why I use it. You can edit where these strings are in the hall that you're using. So this is something that I use on each section basically. And I tell, I, I, you know, you can if you wanted to um, put, you know, the strings over here and the brass over here or the, you know, winds over here. But I basically just put them straight in the middle for this because it's just the strings playing on their own. So it would just kind of be this nice sort of central sound, um, from what I can tell. And it glues the other reverbs together, and it glues the entire sound into one hall. It makes it feel like it's in one hall. So what I ended up with was this. Um, actually, before I go into that, I'll show you how I did the mixing as well. 
So let's bring up the automation. So as you can see here, there's an awful lot going on uh, in the automation. So what I've done is I've turned all the sample libraries up to max because they were just so quiet for some reason compared, compared to the uh, live recordings. And there's just a few bits where I've had to bring it down or bring it up depending on you know the different moments in the recording. So as lovely as the expressive qualities are in this cello solo, I've had to turn it down a bit here at one point, you know, where it says 1.1 here, um, because it was clipping a little bit on top of the rest of the sound. Um, and so without having to go too quiet with the whole mix in order to avoid that clipping, I just turned down that little area there by, you know, just literally uh, a decibel or so and it just stops it from clipping but it doesn't ruin it doesn't uh and it reduce the soloist quality it still keeps it on top of the mix uh, at that volume level for this particular um recording you know this is all recording specific which is why they're all different and they don't all dip down there all the recordings because they're all just completely different but i found this bit you know it needed a little bit of a dip down there but earlier on it was you know quite happy in this area and you know needed a raise here and that's kind of what you've got to do you've got to go through each area of the recording and you basically got to check you know where things are imbalanced in terms of their volume levels and and the general blend of the sound and so like here i've i've turned down the first violin samples because they've just they just go really loud there compared to the live recordings so it, it just it just varies an awful lot um and the same here but most of the changes will be in the live recordings um so let's just get rid of that and move back over here so now you've had a look at all of that and you can see all the mixing going on that i've got here um why don't we have a little listen to it so you can see exactly how it sounds all in one go and what i'll do instead of opening it up in the midi so you can see all the different midi data i think what i'll do is i'll show you this score and uh if you'd like feel free to leave a comment if you'd like to see the score i can uh, uh send it to you um no problem at all so let me see here let me just open the score right i'll press play first lovely right so i was really happy with how that sounded with the live recordings um personally it's one of my favorite cues i've done in this film um it's one of my favorite cues i've done in my career i think personally um but you know i'm just i'm so happy with the the way that it sounded with the uh strings the live recordings and and it really helps just having that little bit of extra know-how with the mixing side of things because I think that will help you guys um, distinguish yourself from people who don't know how to do that in terms of the sound quality and the production level. It, it really does just lift that score off of this sort of, oh it's clearly a fake virtual instrument bed, and it puts it into this amazing environment of reality and the listener is just, you know, consumed by the music as they would be if it was a live orchestra, at least to the extent that you can afford with the budget. Um, and so doing this, just adding one to, you know, like in this case, uh, you know, six or seven or eight so instruments, how many, um, you can just really boost that. So I'm just going to give you a couple more examples. Um, now you know all about how that works and where I've, where other places I've used real uh, music and it is always been strings in this because 
um, I felt that those were the instruments that needed the most help with becoming convincing uh, in terms of their sound quality. So this is the this is the intro of the film. This is the main theme. Um, the main character is called Elijah. This is his theme, and you heard it before in there. Uh, in the last cue, but this is the opening. So originally I actually scored this by hand and then in Dorico um, and at a piano and stuff, but then I sampled it with a uh, sample of it. I did actually have to cut quite a lot of this because they made a few cuts, so that's another thing you have to expect, you know, just you have to make cuts and you have to lose precious music of yours, but at the end of the day you've got you've to suit the director's needs. So this one had a bit more mixing going on than the other one, I would say, because there's, it's hard, you know, there's areas where I wanted the solo instruments to stick out a bit more than, you know, uh, the, than the samples, and vice versa. Mainly where the, in these sections here, you can kind of see where it's just playing like chords, da 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 like that in the violins here, the viola, and then eventually the cello down here. Um, basically, I found that that really didn't sound as good as the melodic recording areas in these. So blending it in still helped it feel more real, but it didn't really need a limelight as much as the uh, other melodic areas. But then again, you know, there's still areas where I've had to like, if we zoom right in here, oh, bloody hell. Uh, here we go. Uh, there's still areas where we have to zoom, uh, where we have to take it down, move it up a little bit, you know, fade it up towards the end because it's quietening down here massively compared to this area. And so to just make it balanced um, without compressing it too much, I've just edited it a little bit and to blend it in. This is again, this is again, if you were going to have this as a solo instrument, just playing on top of it, it would be different because you wouldn't necessarily have to do as much of that because they are playing their own expressive qualities and what I would probably do is make the orchestra tone down um, with a tracking alive onto an orchestra onto a virtual orchestra but because I'm trying to blend the two successfully you have to be prepared to dip little bits of their expressive um, their expression out um, but again, equally, I had to change some of the um, sample uh, modulation and, and expression and stuff to make their dynamics suit the player. So it's a it's a balance of that. That's my advice, really. It's finding a balance between the expressive qualities that the live musician has provided you with and also mixing it with the virtual instruments and not losing too much of the goodness of either and uh, and just blending the two the, you know the best of both into one and that's kind of what you have to sacrifice um, but you know like I say it's different for uh, a soloist so now we've talked about that and again it's the same reverbs and stuff on this one um, let's have a little listen to this track so you can hear I'll, I'll play it without the live recordings first Yeah, so you get the gist. The idea as well, like, you know, there's areas like this. Like, da -da, that kind of is really quite tricky to do with the, um, well, I personally find that really tricky to achieve convincingly with sample instruments. And I didn't make the best effort because with this one, I mean, I, I probably did at the time, but I reckon I could do better if I went back to it and if I had more time. You know, it's quite a tight deadline, so you don't want to spend too much time on that sort of thing. But, like I say, it's pretty hard to achieve convincingly anyway. So having a live musician to double on top of that and play that articulation naturally is so nice. So let's just hear how this sounds with the live recordings. 
And actually, you'd be surprised at how, like, kind of half the time, naff some of the recordings sound on their own, like, as beautiful as they can be. Like, that kind of sounds a bit bare, thin, bony. I think that's just the way that it's been recorded, partly. But also, I wasn't that bothered because that's covered by the basses. If you actually listen to the celli on their own, it's quite similar, really. So it is very, very similar, but when you add the basses in, it really makes a huge difference. I just didn't really have the money with the budget at the time to record a bassist as well as the quartet. So, um... Because I wanted this opening to be a proper kind of quartet type sound. So you can hear how this sounds on its own. So yeah, that's kind of that. So now let's just check this one out with the rest. So that's that one. Um, so yeah, you can kind of get the idea of how you can half the time you can barely tell that this is a live, you know, that they're, they're different. But you know, this one provides the oomph, you know, that orchestral sound, and this one provides the realism and the, the intricate deal, the intricate detail of the performances and the expressive quality. And when you put the two together successfully, it creates what could be seen as, you know. Uh, you know, the, the best makeup, at least, for a real orchestra, I would say. Um, so that is definitely the best you can do without a real orchestra. Well, not necessarily my work, but, you know, what I'm saying is is that just having a, f just ha just having a few um, live players on top of it is probably the best you can do without a live orchestra. So just to uh, top this one off, at the end here, we have a another example of where... Uh, the you know I've just had a, vi a one violin, one second violin and a viola on top of an entire orchestral layout here. This is the winds and brass up here, and originally it sounded pretty pretty kind of fake, especially the violins. Again, it's why I chose to sample them because um, they were carrying a lot of the melodic content, and I think that it made a huge difference in the end, to be honest. And Look, I have to do things like this, but a lot of the time, all you have to do is adjust one volume level so they're just a bit quieter, and maybe the odd little thing like that, and it's it blends nicely. So basically, you guys get the message by now. Um, it's just a, you've got to find that balance of realism, oomph, and mixing, basically. Um, so I will play this one for you, um, and then we can conclude the video. Whoa, hold on.
So that's that. Uh, my apologies for the kind of crappy playback there. I don't know why there were so many clicks and pops. I think sometimes, you know, when it's a huge session like this, even when you have got 64 gigs of RAM or <laughs> and an SSD, it still takes a little while to fully get the the everything going properly. Um, I'd never bothered to freeze all the tracks on this because I didn't need to. When you've been working in a session for like a couple of hours without closing it or reopening it, it does kind of just get used to itself, I find, and uh, you, the clicks and pops disappear, but on this occasion, you know, it's not happened. <laughs> but if you wanted to check out the full quality, you know, mastered as well, these aren't mastered, so if you wanted to listen to the full mastered album, it's on my YouTube channel. I'll leave a link in the description. Um, I'm going to make a condensed version of this video after this one, which will essentially be like, you know, you know, three to five condensed tips of exactly how you should be layering, uh, in my opinion, the best way to layer live uh, musicians with the virtual recordings. I know this is quite a long-winded video, but I wanted to get into the nitty-gritty for those of you who enjoy these sorts of walkthroughs. Um, but for the ones of you who don't have so much of an attention span, uh, I will do a condensed breakdown. Um, but I suppose there's a bit point of saying that now at the end of the video. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for watching. Um, it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoy these videos. Please do leave a like, subscribe, and comment on what you would like to see from me if, if you enjoyed this video, if you'd like me to release any of the pure live musician recordings, you know, anything. Just say hi. I'd really like to hear from you. Um, and yeah, so thank you very much, and I will see you next time. See ya. Bye.